This is a podcast on non-opioid intravenous anesthetics. My name is Randy Shell. This podcast is developed by the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology, November 2015. We'll first look at the uh, American Board of Anesthesia keywords that were uh, distributed by the American Board in 2005 to 2015 on the non-opioid intravenous anesthetic topics. First of all, propofol, effects on the central nervous system, its mechanism of action, a little bit about propofol infusion syndrome, automidate, adrenal suppression, some of the side effects of automidate, seizure, act, seizure activation by anesthetics, probably automidate was central to this question, ketamine, systemic effects, its pharmacodynamics, what receptors it acts on, some of its side effects, the fact that ketamine doesn't have the uh, effect on this that many of our other hypnotic agents do that is to depress it, uh, the ketamine analgesia and what receptors are involved in that, bronchodilatory anesthetic drugs, probably ketamine was uh, part of this discussion, dexmedetomine, mainly focusing on cardiovascular and respiratory effects and hemodynamic effects, and although thiopental is not currently available, methylhexatol is, and questions uh, related to barbiturates may still be present and therefore will be covered in this uh, podcast. Uh, there are some miscellaneous topics, including myoclonus, effect of our IV anesthetics on SSCPs, MH, and what drugs trigger it, specifically in inhaled volatile anesthetics and succinylcholine, not our intravenous anesthetics, ECT, or electroconvulsive therapy, and anesthetic agents effect on duration, specifically that propofol decreases it significantly and uh, context sensitive halftime, uh, which refers to when you infuse a drug over a period of time and shut it off, how long is it going to take for its uh, pharmacokinetic uh, profile to uh, wear off and decrease uh, in half. And then SSEPs again, drugs that increase the amplitude, uh, atomidate and ketamine are the two that increase amplitude. So we'll focus on these IV anesthetic drugs Specifically, propofol first. Uh, FOS propofol came out in 2008 or so. Uh, atomidate or amidate, ketamine, dexmedetomidine or Presidex, and thiopental, another name for pentothal, methylhexatol, or brevitol. These are the non opioid IV anesthetics we'll be talking about. Now, these intravenous anesthetics are very lipid soluble agents that easily cross the blood brain barrier. They have a rapid onset. In fact, one pass from the intravenous injection site to the brain, approximately 30 seconds or so, and the onset begins. We use them to induce general anesthesia, maintain anesthesia, such as in total intravenous anesthesia with propofol, uh, sometimes combined with remifentanil or other drugs and in sedation uh, techniques in both the operating room and the ICU. If we look at these IV non-opioid anesthetics and the components of anesthesia, uh, classically we think of amnesia, analgesia, hypnosis or sleep, and muscle relaxation as components of general anesthesia. You can see that propofol, automidate, and thiopental are mainly hypnotic agents that result in sleep-like state while dexmedetomine and ketamine not only cause hypnosis, but have analgesic properties also, and ketamine on top of that has amnestic properties. So ketamine has uh, not only hypnotic properties, but also analgesic and amnestic properties. Both dexmedetomine and ketamine have analgesic properties, while uh, the usual IV induction agents, propofol and atomidate, are hypnotic agents without analgesic uh, properties. The mechanism of action of our IV induction agents is demonstrated here. If you look at the top left, you can see that uh, the barbiturates, benzodiazepines, propofol and atomidate act at the GABA receptor in some way facilitating chloride conductance such that a negative anion increases intracellularly, making that neuron farther from firing threshold, although a simplistic explanation. This is one of the current explanations, GABA facilitation by many of our drugs. The GABA receptor is complex with multiple uh, subunits here, and our drugs act at different portions on that GABA receptor. 
The NMDA receptor uh, is shown in the top right uh, of this uh, graphic, and you can see that ketamine acts in the uh, NMDA receptor and uh, has a blocking effect here, such that sodium and calcium do not go in as much, and uh, you are blocking an excitatory effect. So ketamine acts at the NMDA receptor. Most of our drugs act at the GABA receptor. And uh, dexmedetomidine is different. Its mechanism of action is uh, effect on the alpha-2 receptor, an agonistic effect uh, on the alpha-2 receptor. And we have alpha-2 agonism that results in inhibition of norepinephrine release. And actually dexmedetomidine acts both centrally and peripherally to reduce norepinephrine levels. And if norepinephrine is reduced uh, in the central nervous system, you have a sleep-like state or sedation that reduces MAC. And in the periphery, you can get a uh, reduction in sympathetic activity, specifically a drop in blood pressure and heart rate. It has a, a morphine sparing effect or analgesic-like effect. So if we look at the mechanism of action of our drugs, barbiturates, propofol, and atomate have an effect on GABA receptors. Well, ketamine is antagonistic at the NMDA receptor, does not interact with the GABA receptor, and does not facilitate that the GABA receptor like atomidate, barbiturates, and propofol do. But not only does ketamine act at the NMDA receptor uh, and block it, but it also acts at the nicotinic, muscarinic, monaminergic, opioid receptors. It's a very dirty drug crossing multiple receptors, including inhibition of sodium channels, which is the classic local anesthetic effect, and calcium channels, and may be part of the reason why ketamine has a cerebral vasodilatory effect. And dexmedetomidine, we said, was an alpha-2, and should say agonist here, uh, in the central and peripheral nervous system. If we look at the chemistry of IV anesthetics, you can see propofol at the bottom, uh, phenolic compound, atomidate, a carboxylated imidazole, and thiopental up at the top, a barbituric acid derivative. And if you look at thiopental, uh, it has a sulfur molecule, therefore the thio component of it, while in methylhexatol, it's also uh, derived from barbituric acid, but has an oxygen in it, therefore it's called an oxybarbiturate. Starting with propofol, it is supplied uh, characteristically as a 1% or 10 mg per mil lipid emulsion uh, in egg yolk lecithin. And people worry then, well, should I give propofol to a patient who's egg allergic? Well, egg yolk uh, is the egg yolk lecithin, that is, is that propofol is in uh, that the emulsion is developed in. Most of the protein in eggs is in the whites. And so, Really, the current evidence suggests that if you're allergic to eggs, you're not really more likely to develop anaphylaxis when exposed to propofol, and in most cases, propofol can be used. Uh, or there's lots of other alternatives. If you're worried, uh, you have atomidate, ketamine, and other drugs that can be used to induce general anesthesia. Induction, sedation, and general anesthesia, propofol can be used for all of the above. Um, it is very lipid soluble, like all of our induction drugs, and crosses the blood brain very quickly with a rapid onset, affecting and facilitating the GABA receptor and chloride conductance. Its short acting hypnotic effect is because it redistributes rapidly from the brain, but its lack of hangover effect is mainly because of its rapid metabolism, not only in the liver, but also extrahepatically, multiple other areas in the body. It's chewed up rapidly. Uh, doesn't have active metabolites, and so you have less of a hangover, and people feel good afterwards. Not only do they feel good because the drug's not there sedating them, but they may feel good because it increases dopamine in areas of your brain, like the nucleus accumbens, which uh, is similar to what happens with drugs of abuse. Propofol has an antiemetic property in patients with postoperative nausea and vomiting. Substituting propofol will reduce the chance of uh, postoperative nausea and vomiting, and often is the main component of an anesthetic in those type of patients. Its anti-emetic effect, anti effect may be it decreases uh, serotonin in the area postrema, nausea vomiting center of our brain, uh, although the mechanism is incompletely understood. 
Propofol can cause pain on injection, especially when injected into uh, small hand veins. We can try to reduce that pain by putting in larger IVs and cubital veins, for example, voiding the dorsum of the hand, putting some lidocaine in with the propofol or lidocaine through the IV beforehand. Uh, multiple uh, ways of attempting to reduce uh, the pain of injection are attempted giving opioids early, having patients breathe nitrous oxide beforehand. All of these uh, are because it hurts quite significantly, especially when given through a small IV and a small hand vein, for example. Um, lipid emulsion that propofol comes in can promote bacterial growth. It often has additives, metabisulfite or EDTA, to prevent this. But when you open uh, propofol, you should use it short period of time or discard it because of the possibility of bacterial growth. There's been worries in the past of sepsis induced by bacteria that grew in propofol emulsions and then were administered to patients. There's some newer formulations that have been developed, uh, lower lipid and aqueous soluble types of propofol that have not caught on uh, uh, totally in clinical practice. Now, some clinical points about propofol. One, propofol infusion syndrome. This is a rare but uh, often fatal syndrome that can occur in patients who are on relatively high dose and long-term infusions of propofol, usually for sedation in critically ill patients, often in children in the past, that is, uh, who presented with acute refractory bradycardia. Their heart rate went down, not sure why, refractory to drugs, uh, proceeds on to asystole, may develop rhabdomyolysis, before that time, may develop early tachycardia with metabolic acidosis. And you wonder why are they having such poor perfusion of the peripheral tissues? Why are they in uh, cardiac failure? Their, their uh, plasma may, may be lipemic. And the mechanism of this propofol infusion syndrome uh, resulting in these cardiovascular uh, abnormalities that may lead to asystole and death and this metabolic acidosis and cardiomyopathy probably is related to all this lipid and mitochondrial toxicity uh, that can occur with the lipid uh, emulsions. Some other clinical points, when you're dosing propofol in the very young or the very old in children, the induction dose and maintenance dose of propofol tends to be uh, need to be increased because they have a large central compartment and they clear it very rapidly. Conversely, the elderly have a smaller central compartment and don't clear it as well. Their organs are not quite as good, uh, liver, kidneys, etc. And many drugs uh, require a decreased dosing in the elderly. And uh, propofol should be decreased. And when large doses of out out propofol are given to elderly patients, it can result in severe hypotension. Electroconvulsive therapy, if you use propofol for ECT therapy, the duration of motor and electroencephalographic uh, seizures are significantly shorter with propofol than other IV anesthetics. Often methylhexatol uh, is used for ECT because it tends not to uh, block uh, the seizure duration, which is important to the therapeutic effect of um, uh, the ECT that you're performing. Lipid disorders, if there's lots of lipid in the propofol, uh, patients who have disorders of lipid metabolism, you really wouldn't want to give it to them. And so an absolute contraindication is disorders of fat metabolism. Be very cautious in administering it to patients who are hyperlipidemic and, for example, uh, have pancreatitis. Some physiologic effects of propofol, when induction doses are given to patients, hypotension uh, frequently results. Main reason, they vasodilate and there is myocardial depression and the baroreceptors are blocked quite significantly so you do not get that reflex of tachycardia that you uh, should have to prevent the hypotension or at least reduce the amount of hypotension. And patients will usually become apneic because there's respiratory depressant effect. The oxygen use by the brain goes down. As the oxygen use by the brain goes down, it doesn't need as much blood flow. Since there's auto-regulation, both oxygen use and blood flow go down. 
and the cerebral blood volume tends to go down and ICP can go down. One of the important points to remember though is that if you have a major drop in cerebral perfusion pressure, which could occur if blood pressure drops significantly, uh, propofol may have a negative impact on uh, brain perfusion uh, and uh, cerebral perfusion pr pressure specifically. MAP minus ICP. If MAP drops a lot and ICP drops a little, you can see how cerebral perfusion pressure could be negatively impacted. Some other physiologic effects of propofol, if you have high doses, you can actually cause an isoelectric EEG. Your BIS uh, or EEG monitoring can be flat, BIS is zero. Propofol doesn't trigger MH like our volatile anesthetics and, and or succinylcholine. Occasionally, when propofol is given intravenously, patients will develop non-epileptic myoclonus, probably related to an imbalance of excitatory inhibitory control where they have involuntary movements as they go off to sleep, but this seems to be less than automatic methylhexitol. So myoclonic movements are associated with automatic methylhexitol and propofol, uh, and automatic methylhexitol tend to be much more than does propofol. Propofol does have anticonvulsant properties. Um, classically, when someone's convulsing, has a seizure, we get benzodiazepines, barbiturates, but propofol also has anticonvulsant properties. It decreases hypoxic and hypercarbon drive, which means that if you have propofol infusing and a patient becomes hypoxic, they're breathing spontaneously, they will not hyperventilate like they would otherwise. Same thing if propofol is infusing and they're breathing spontaneously, and they get hypercarbic, they're not going to uh, increase the respiratory rate as much as they would if they did not have propofol infusion. It doesn't inhibit hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction like the volatile uh, anesthetics does, and it doesn't enhance neuromuscular blockade. Uh, remember the volatile anesthetics like SIBO, isoflurane, and desflurane do enhance neuromuscular blockade. Baroreceptors are blunted with propofol, that's one of the major reasons why hypotension results with induction. You know, vasodilation, myocardial depression, and lack of reflex tachycardia and resultant hypotension. Moving on to phospropofol, it is a water-soluble prodrug of propofol in an attempt to get away from having to use the lipid emulsions. And, uh, attempt to decrease the pain that occurs on injection and avoid some of those lipid emulsion issues such as uh, growing bacteria and uh, maybe lipid in, or uh, propofol infusion syndrome. The effect profile of phospropofol is very similar to propofol itself, but notice in the graphic at the very bottom, phospropofol when administered is uh, acted upon by alkaline phosphatase resulting in the actual drug propofol. So phospropofol is a prodrug that requires alkaline phosphatase to convert it to propofol. And one of the things that uh, is made from this reaction is formaldehyde. Uh, it doesn't sound real good to have formaldehyde circulating around your body, but it doesn't seem to be a huge problem. So phospropofol developed in an attempt to reduce the uh, problems with uh, lipids and provide a water-soluble form of propofol in a prodrug uh, format. Let's move on to automidate. Automidate is intravenous short-acting hypnotic like propofol. Its dose is uh, usually 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram for induction, 15, 20 or more uh, milligrams for a 70 kilogram person. Atomidate is supplied in a solution containing 35% propylene glycol, and because of that, it also burns when you inject it in many patients. It's lipid soluble, crosses the blood brain barrier like propofol does, and facilitates GABA conductance. There is also rapid awakening due to redistribution. It's not chewed up quite as fast as uh, propofol is. The main reason atomidate is used for induction is because of its minimal cardiovascular effects. It also has minimal respiratory depression, and uh, when induction is uh, performed with atomidate, uh, blood pressure does not change much, uh, 
but change is similar to a sleep-like state, which may be a very small decrease in blood pressure, heart rate, etc. Now, the side effects of Atomidate are, one, post-operative nausea and vomiting, and one of the main reasons it's not used uh, for every patient, basically. Um, some people call it, instead of Atomidate, they call it Vomidate, uh, because of this high incidence of post-operative nausea and vomiting. It does hurt on injection because of the 35% propylene glycol that brings it into solution. It does uh, cause occasional myoclonus or non-voluntary movements uh, in patients. Remember that Brevitol or Methylhexatol, Atomidate, and Propofol all can cause myoclonus. Atomidate tends to do it more. And the classic side effect of Atomidate is adrenal suppression, which we'll show more in the next graphic. Uh, but the adrenal suppression caused by Atomidate in a single induction dose tends to be short. Uh, talking hours, not days, and tends to be of insignificance in most patients. However, patients who have been in the ICU for an extended period of time on inotropic support, catecholamine depleted, uh, patients who have adrenal disorders uh, such as Addison's, uh, you would want to avoid atomidate in many of these patients. And if you look here, you can see why atomidate has an effect on steroidogenesis. Here's cholesterol going down to cortisol, or glucocorticoids on the left, and uh, circled in red. And on the right side of this graphic, you can see cor uh, cholesterol going down to mineral corticoid, aldosterone. 11-beta-hydroxylase is inhibited by atomidate, and so both the formation of glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids is inhibited by atomidate. The physiologic effects of atomidate are shown here. The minimal change on heart rate, blood pressure, and cardiac output makes it a great choice for patients with low ejection fraction, poor cardiac function, cardiomyopathy, shock, etc. Um, it doesn't have a lot of depression of respiratory system, unlike propofol. When you give propofol, patients will go apneic. Often with atomidate induction dose, they'll continue to breathe even though they are hypnotic sleep. The Atomidate uh, puts the brain to sleep like propofol does, and so the oxygen use goes down and blood flow goes down concomitantly because of auto regulation, and intracranial pressure can go down because of less blood in the head, cerebral blood volume. But one of the good things about Atomidate is that cerebral perfusion pressure, which is MAP minus ICP again, will be maintained patients because MAP doesn't change much at all and ICP is reduced. So as opposed to propofol, which can have a negative effect on cerebral perfusion pressure, atomidate tends to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure. Let's move on to ketamine now. Ketamine is also lipid soluble, has to cross the blood-brain barrier, but unlike propofol and unlike atomidate, it has an antagonistic effect and at a different receptor, the NMDA receptor. Now remember, ketamine uh, has effects at multiple other receptors. It's a very dirty drug, but we classically think of its NMDA effects uh, uh, mainly. It's structurally related to uh, PCP, uh, which is a street name called angel dust, and a drug of abuse, or sometimes it's called vitamin K. It can be given intravenously, intramuscularly, or orally. And if you mix it with oral midazolam, uh, it can cause almost a general anesthetic state uh, preoperatively uh, for patients, for example, children who you want to sedate very heavily before going back for, uh, to the operating room. It classically causes this dissociative anesthetic state, the only drug that we use that does such, dissociative anesthesia because it dissociates the thalamus from the limbic system. When a pain signal comes up the spinal cord, crosses over, goes to the thalamus, to the limbic system, to the cortical projections, if you short circuit the connection between the thalamus and the limbic system, uh, you have dissociated uh, the whole the sensory uh, conduction and uh, the cortical perception of pain. And patients end up in this dissociative anesthetic state, uh, similar to the patient down in the bottom right. Uh, cataleptic state. They will lay there with their eyes open oftentimes with slow nystagmus gaze back and forth. They'll be amnestic and analgesic uh, 
for procedures such as burn dressing changes, uh, fracture, uh, relocation, and this is often used in the ER for such uh, procedures. Emergence delirium is one of the complications of ketamine where patients who are administered, especially higher doses of ketamine, on awakening say that they feel like they are seeing, hearing things that are not there. I've had patients say, I feel like I am in Star Wars. Not seeing Star Wars, but in Star Wars. So emergence delirium can occur with ketamine. It can be reduced by small doses of benzodiazepines like midazolam. And the airway secretions that occur because of ketamine's uh, sympathetic cholinergic effects um, can be blocked by drugs like glycoparolate. Atropine is a bad choice because atropine crosses the blood brain barrier and can make emergence delirium worse. So glycoparolate and midazolam may be combined with ketamine to decrease emergence delirium in the case of midazolam and decrease airway secretions in the case of glycoparolate. Ketamine's physiologic effects are greatly different than the other drugs we discussed. It stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. Blood pressure and heart rate tend to go up. It preserves respirations. It is a bronchodilator. If you stimulate the sympathetic nervous system and have beta-2 effects, you'd, if, you'd expect bronchodilation. Beta-1 effects, you'd expect an increase in heart rate and contractility. Their secretions go up, and you can have uh, so much secretions that uh, laryngospasm actually can occur and oftentimes will dry a patient, as mentioned previously, with glycopyrrolate um, to decrease those secretions. Unlike atomidate and propofol, cerebral metabolism, metabolism actually goes up in the brain. As metabolism goes up, blood flow also goes up. When blood flow goes up, cerebral blood volume goes up, and ICP can increase, and therefore the recommendation uh, that ICP that is, ketamine should be avoided in patients with high intracranial pressure in most cases. Clinical uses of ketamine include the following. Pediatric anesthesia, where it can be given intramuscularly, orally, or even intranasally in patients without an IV. If you want to give ketamine intramuscularly, uh, you uh, give doses much higher than the intravenous doses for induction of anesthesia, doses approximately um, five times, four to five times or more. So we're talking three to 10 milligrams per kilogram. While oral ketamine, six to 10 milligrams per kilogram, if you combine it with midazolam, you lower that dose. Asthmatic patients specifically could benefit from ketamine because of its bronchodilatory effect. Hypovolemic patients in shock or hypotensive could use a stimulant of the cardiovascular system. But interestingly, if you take a patient <clears throat> and who is uh, sympathectomized, denervated, uh, for example, a quadriplegic patient um, who uh, and give ketamine to, ketamine main effect on the cardiovascular system, the heart muscle itself, is a depressant effect of the heart muscle if it's not innervated. And so you may uncover a negative inotropic effect of ketamine in some patients who are denervated. But in the intact uh, nervous system patient, most times, ketamine will result in uh, increasing heart rate, blood pressure, stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, and therefore useful in the hypovolemic shock patient. In a patient with tamponade, uh, where you want to maintain vascular resistance and heart rate and contractility until you can evacuate the uh, fluid around the heart, ketamine is uh, frequently useful. In patients with right to left shunts, such as tetralogy of flow, where you do not want to reduce systemic vascular resistance, but maintain it so that right to left shunt will be reduced and saturations will stay up, oxygen saturations it is. Ketamine is often used for induction. Burn dressing changes where ketamine can provide analgesia and amnesia for a short period of time and then be gone so the patient can eat, ambulate, and uh, do the activities of daily living. Um, and then have other burn dressing changes later in the day, possibly with ketamine. That's one of the uses uh, ketamine in the past has been frequently uh, beneficial for. Ketamine dart of, uh, can be used when you have uh, a patient who doesn't have an IV in and you need to induce general anesthesia. You can give intramuscular ketamine in higher doses of somewhere around 3 to 10 milligrams per kilogram and then uh, place an IV afterwards. 
ER frequently uses uh, ketamine. And the reason why it uses ketamine is because it keeps patients breathing and keeps the blood pressure up and can be used to suture wounds in children, for example, set fractures in uh, children, uh, and uh, uh, provides the analgesia and uh, uh, amnesia that's beneficial to do those procedures. Some clinical points about ketamine. It can increase intracranial pressure, but if you uh, hyperventilate the patient, you can blunt that. If you give ketamine to a patient uh, and follow your BIS, the BIS tends not to decrease like it does with propofol and automidate. In fact, will often stay high even though that patient is in a ketamine cataleptic-like state. Because ketamine increases catecholamines, and if catecholamines like norepinephrine go increase in their concentration, norepinephrine has an alpha-1 effect, but it's a constricting effect specifically, and it can cause an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. So giving ketamine to someone with pulmonary hypertension may not be a wise choice. Ketamine as it's currently supplied comes as an R and an S mixture, and it seems that the S isomer is actually more potent and has less psychomimetic side effects. And so if we just use the one isomer instead of a mixed semic mix, we may have some uh, less psychosomatic side effects, but in the United States it's supplied as uh, or receiving mixture. When you give ketamine to a patient, oftentimes they'll have uh, eye movements that go back and forth with nystagmus, and uh, intraocular pressure can be increased. We previously mentioned emergence delirium. The risk of emergence delirium tends to be higher uh, when greater than 15 years old. In females, when the dose is high, like 2 milligrams per kilogram, in patients with previous psychiatric history, and uh, with anticholinergic agents that cross the blood brain barrier like atropine or scopolamine. There is some popularity of using uh, uh, ketamine and propofol together in a ketoprol or proket combination. Uh, uh, and in low doses, the ketamine can reduce the amount of opioids that are needed, especially in the ambulatory like procedures, and potentially reduce the chance of postoperative nausea and vomiting. So the ketamine provides some of the analgesia, the propofol supplies the hypnosis, and a TIVA anesthetic, and reduces the amount of uh, opioids that are required. Dexmedetomine uh, is a, another intravenous drug, intravenous hypnotic drug. It has potent alpha-2 agonist effect. Uh, it is mainly used as a sedative sedative type medication uh, for patients in the intensive care units where it's infused and uh, patients who are on mechanical ventilation while they're receiving dexmedetomine can tolerate having the endotracheal tube and undergo mechanical ventilation much better. It provides sedation, analgesia, anxiolysis. It's more selective than clonidine for the alpha-2 receptor. Both clonidine and dexmedetomine have a similar mechanism of action, however alpha-2 agonism. It has a relatively short half-life of about two hours, and its hypnotic effect is uh, probably related to hyperpolarization of noradrenergic neurons in the locus ruleus, and frequently will use it uh, for sedation in the ICU, as previously mentioned, but there are many other uses for it, and I'll point out several of those in a bit here. But let's look at the mechanism again of dexmedetomine to remind you that it is an alpha-2 agonist in the central and peripheral nervous system, inhibiting norepinephrine release, causing sedation, less catecholamines in the brain, MAC goes down, so if you have dexmedetomine infusing, similar to clonidine that we used to give in the past orally before surgery, reduces the MAC of volatile inhaled anesthetics. It also causes a decrease in sympathetic activity in the periphery, since the heart rate and blood pressure tends to decrease and has an analgesic uh, morphine spurring effect. So looking at dexmedetomidine and physiologic effects, uh, in summary here, cardiovascular effects, if you reduce uh, norepinephrine peripherally, you're going to decrease blood pressure and heart rate. Barrel reflexes tend to be maintained. If you bolus rapidly dexmedetomidine, you can see a transient hypertension, which is uh, interesting, and probably related to its alpha-2b effect. 
So normally we see hypotension when we give it slowly over time, but if we bolus it, um, you, know, you can see transient hypertension paradoxically. It has very minimal effect on the respiratory system, and one of the main reasons why it's used in the ICU, especially during weaning for mechanical ventilation, because it can be left on infusing, keeping the patient uh, 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 anxiolytic lysis and tolerating that endotracheal tube and the mechanical ventilation right through extubation and can be left on. It provides a sedated but arousable state. You can call it a patient's name and they'll arouse and uh, you can do neurologic exams, leave them alone, they can go back to sleep. A very much a sleep-like state under, unlike many of the other drugs that we have. Some clinical uses of dexmedetomine, other than sedation in the ICU, neurosurgery where you want to do uh, frequent evaluations, even sedation in awake patients, procedural sedation in pediatrics and some adults, awake fiber optic innovation where you want someone breathing spontaneously without any uh, respiratory depression, but with anxiolysis, with adequate topicalization of an airway, awake fiber optic can be done very successfully with uh, dexmedetomine sedation. Cardiac surgery in the post-operative period, dexmedetomine is used uh, to provide sedation through uh, weaning and extubation. And in bariatric surgery where your goal in these obese patients is to do your best to avoid opioids and any drugs that will reduce respiratory drive. Now there's some other drugs uh, the, the barbiturates that used to be used very commonly. I'm going to touch on them briefly. Thiopental, uh, because of its use in euthanasia or in um, um, death penalty cases, uh, thiopental was not provided in the United States by manufacturers outside the United States who disagreed with this use of it in death penalty cases that we've had trouble getting a hold of thalpental, but in the past it was frequently used just like propofol for induction. Rapid onset of unconsciousness occurs when it's given intravenously. It also has an effect on the GABA receptor like propofol and atomate facilitating chloride conduction, conductance. It's very alkaline and it will precipitate with other drugs that are acidic. Rock burning was the classic one where you get a rock in your IV if you combine thalpental and rock burning together without a flush in between. It has no analgesic properties and actually has hyperalgesic uh, effects at subhypnotic doses. So it's uh, not having pain relieving effects and actually uh, hyperalgesia can occur. You awaken because of redistribution like the other drugs, but unlike propofol where it is rapidly metabolized, hepatic metabolism without pentol is very slow. In fact, the half-life is somewhere around 10 to 12 hours and if it takes three half-lives to get rid of a drug, you can see why a patient could have uh, a hangover 24 hours after induction with thiopental. Let's look at the concept of redistribution a little bit more in detail here. The reason why patients awaken uh, after a single dose, uh, induction dose of most of our drugs. If you look at time zero, the drug is in the blood 100% and very quickly within 30 to 60 seconds you can see that it's starting to peak in the brain um, and then when you look out here at about 4 to 20 minutes or so it's starting to go up in the lean body tissues or the muscle and then over time it's accumulating fat. Why do we awaken? Because the drug goes to the brain but then rapidly redistributes in minutes away from the brain such that the drug levels are low enough that it's not gone from the body per se, but it's gone from our main effector site that we're uh, mainly worried about, which is the brain, our target, and the patient will awaken because of redistribution. So ketamine redistributes, atomate redistributes, uh, profile redistributes, barbiturates redistribute. Some undesirable effects of the barbiturate, specifically thiopental, venous thrombosis and IVs, you can get a really hard vein after a thrombosis. If you inject it in an artery accidentally, for example, uh, you're in a hurry and inject it in one of the tubing that goes to your um, radio arterial catheter, you can get a chemical arteritis where the intima is damaged and um, platelets adhere, arterial occlusion and vasoconstriction occurs, 
and the hand can look like the one at the bottom down here. And the treatment is an anticoagulation to avoid clots forming in the blood vessels where the intima has been damaged, sympathectomy to result in vasodilation, an example being stellate ganglion block, and even injection of intraarterial vasodilator directly in the artery to reduce the vasospasm. Some clinical points of thiopental, like propofol, we need to reduce the dose in the elderly. It's not dull because they're more sensitive. It's not their brains are more pharmacodynamically sensitive to the drug. It's basically a pharmacokinetic explanation. I like to think of it as the drug goes up to the brain and just doesn't redistribute as fast from the vessel-rich group. It stays up there longer, slower redistribution. There are some situations where we reduce the dose that listed here hypovolemic shock patient, probably not a wise idea to use thiopental. Uh, uh, acidosis, reduced protein binding states often result in increased free drug and we would want to decrease the dose or choose a different drug. And the classic contraindication to barbiturates is porphyria, um, acute intermittent porphyria specifically. If we look at the physiologic effects of thiopental, you can see that it's a veno and vasodilator venodilation occurs, preload goes down, uh, if preload goes down, uh, end diastolic volume goes down, and cardiac output can go down. Myocardial depression also occurs with thiopental, and blood pressure decreases because of these mechanisms. However, the blood pressure does not decrease as much as propofol. Remember that propofol not only vasodilates and venodilates and depresses the heart, but also blocks the reflex tachycardia because of its baroreceptor blocking. Thalpental is very much of a respiratory depression, depressant, as was propofol. Remember, ketamine and atomate were not nearly as much. And thalpental has a similar effect on the brain as did atomate and propofol, putting it to sleep, reducing blood flow, reducing uh, ICP. Methylhexatol is still used in electroconvulsive therapy, occasionally for cardioversions, uh, things like that. Uh, it's an oxybarbitrate as opposed to thiopental, which is a sulfur-containing thiobarbitrate. Patients tend to hiccup a lot, and pain on injection, like atomidate did and like propofol did. So uh, methylhexadol also causes some um, extra, uh, some motor myoclonic-type activity, as did atomidate and propofol when they go to sleep. So some bad side effects of methylhexadol, the hiccups, the pain on injection, myoclonus, but one good thing about methylhexatol, it's cleared quite rapidly as opposed to thiopental, which was cleared uh, a lot slower. And for ECTs, when used for electroconvulsive therapy, there tends to be a longer seizure duration as compared with, for example, propofol. Uh, and so it has some benefits when used uh, for electroconvulsive therapy. It's uh, more potent than uh, thiopental and it's cleared more rapidly. So let's finish up here and just look at a couple things related to the pharmacodynamics and kinetics of these drugs. The pharmacokinetics first just point out a couple factors. One, um, that ketamine has very little protein binding compared to the other drugs, which tend to be highly protein bound. That's one difference. Another difference to point out is why is methylhexatol um, have such a, a less hangover? Well, it's cleared much more rapidly than is the barbiturate thiopental. A couple interesting points. Another one is the volume and distribution of these drugs tends to be quite high because they're very lipid soluble. We talked about redistribution. We'll not talk much more about that other than to point out that all of our drugs redistribute to some extent. Propofol not only redistributes, but is rapidly, hepatically, and extrahepatically cleared from the body and uh, with less hangover because of those inactive metabolites and the fact that it's chewed up so rapidly. The concept of context-sensitive halftime refers to when you infuse a drug for some duration, here we're showing from zero hours up to nine hours of uh, some of our IV drugs, if you shut it off, how long does it take uh, for uh, the uh, concentration to decrease in half? Try to get an idea of how long it's going to take till a patient awakens. 
And you can see that atomidate and propofol and ketamine have a pretty good infusion uh, contact sensitive halftime kinetic profile, meaning that you could use those for longer term infusions, shut them off, and have a patient awaken uh, more predictably than it would with thiopental, dizepam, or Valium, or even midazolam. So, contact sensitive halftime propofol, the classic one that we use for infusions, it has a very favorable. Context Some comparative pharmacodynamics now. <clears throat> Looking at propofol uh, first, you can see that hemodynamically it drops the blood pressure the most. The reason we said was because it not only vasodilates, venodilates, cardiodepressants, but also blocks the baroreceptor reflexing so that heart rate does not go up. Atomidate had very little effect on the cardiovascular system and ketamine stimulated it. If we looked at the brain, you can see that our main drugs of barbiturates, propofol, and atominate put the brain to sleep such that blood flow and oxygen uh, went down the use of such, and uh, uh, ketamine was the one that did just the opposite of raising blood flow to the head, intracranial pressure, cerebral metabolism. When you look at SCCPs or somatosensory low potentials that we often use during back surgery to monitor the uh, neurologic integrity of our spinal cord and nerve tracts, you can see that thiopental profile and atomidate and um, to some extent ketamine, but not as much, make it take a little longer for the signal to get through, which is called latency. Uh, thiopental profile and atomidate uh, and ketamine, however, uh, have some differences with amplitude. And if you look at atomic and ketamine specifically where the blue stars are, you can see that atomic and ketamine actually can make the amplitude go up or make the signal bigger. So that if we're having problems getting SSEP signals, substituting some of our anesthetic, uh, at maybe propofol, uh, with atomidate and or ketamine in some combination may make the amplitude of the SSEP signal better and able to read it uh, better and monitor the uh, spinal cord and nerve tracts. I gave you a, a summary chart here. Um, you can stop this podcast if you like and look it over. And, uh, this will just summarize some of the things we talked about. And if you look back over at the ABA keywords as we finish up now, you can see that propofol central nervous system effects, we know that it decreases the cerebral metabolism and cerebral blood flow and intracranial pressure but can have a negative effect on cerebral perfusion pressure. It acts via facilitation of the GABA receptor and propofol infusion syndrome is uh, oftentimes in the uh, ICU where a patient who's been on propofol for a long period of time develops metabolic acidosis, uh, develops uh, drug resistant bradycardia and hypotension and decreased cardiac you would worry about propofol infusion syndrome. It is rare, but should be considered in patients who are receiving propofol for extended period of times, and it may be the lipid effect on the mitochondria. Atomate, the adrenal suppression, we talked about 11-beta-hydroxylase inhibition, glucocorticoid and mineral corticoids go down, but in most patients this is of little consequence, except those who may be uh, uh, steroid depleted. Some of the side effects of atomate include nausea vomiting after surgery, and this myoclonic effect where patients will move as they're going off to sleep and can activate seizures in anesthetics. Uh, it's one of the anesthetics that can do that. Ketamine raises blood pressure, acts via the NMDA receptor, doesn't have much effect on the bis, uh, and is a bronchodilator. Dexmedetomidine, because it decreases central and peripheral norepinephrine, can cause bradycardia and hypotension. Barbiturates, although we don't use those very often, um, um, occasionally barbiturates are still used in ICU for barbiturate coma to reduce cerebral metabolism um, and control intracranial pressure, um, but rarely will there be uh, any questions on this drug on any exams, and clinically it's not uh, useful because we can't get a hold of it. Methylhexadol is the exception, the oxybarbiturate that still is occasionally used for electroconvulsive therapy. 
myoclonus by IV drugs, you would think of Atomidate, you would think of Methylhexitol, and you would think of Propofol. SSCP latency, all of our drugs make it take longer to get through basically, um, but Atomidate and Ketamine are different in that they make the amplitude bigger. These drugs are safe for patients with MH. Remember, it's the volatile anesthetics and succinylcholine that are uh, triggers of MH. Electroconvulsive therapy. Propofol is going to decrease the duration of electroconvulsive therapy. Um, Methylhexitol is one of the better choices, uh, although uh, propofol can also be used. Context sensitive halftime. We talked about propofol and the beneficial, uh, favorable context sensitive halftime for infusions and atomic and ketamine increase the amplitude of SSCP signals. We'll finish there. This is the end. I hope you have a great day. Uh, this summer I had a bucket list trip to Italy, cycling in the Italian Dolomites. This is Ludovico Terme in the distance, July 2015. Have a good one.